Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special interview. Today we have a returning guest to the show, Keith Weiner of Monetary Metals, located at monetary-metals.com. And I got to tell you, if you're following these markets right now, your head is probably spinning with all of the euphoric whipsaw action. And if you've gone to a big box store lately, you're probably scratching your head wondering why the shelves are so bare and prices keep going up. So we've got to make some sense of what in the heck is going on in the markets and the economy right now. And since I have this sneaky suspicion that it has to do with the Fed, the federal government, and the U.S. dollar, we need a person who understands those overlapping dynamics like no other. And I can't think of a better person than Keith Weiner to help us do that. That's exactly what we're going to do. Keith, I'd like to thank you for joining us again on Silver Doctors. Thanks for uh, the great introduction and thanks for having me. Now, Keith, we've got to start with this wild speculation in the markets because, you know, just yesterday, every single person had a comment on GameStop. Even Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez had a comment on GameStop. Weirdly enough, Fed Chair Powell refused to comment on GameStop, but just let's start off getting your thoughts, which is this market speculation that we're seeing. You know, silver's up 7.5% from its spike low yesterday. There's just crazy swings going on in the markets right now. Help us make a little bit of sense out of that, Keith. How do I even begin with that? Well, I guess, first of all, GameStop is very heavily shorted. I think that's pretty well understood. Um and uh, not a particularly liquid stock. So the number of shares short were a very high ratio of, uh, you know, more than 100% of the float. And so, um, you know, that's, what do you call that? A bug looking for a windshield, a powder keg looking for a spark to get into the fuse. I mean, it, you know, I, I picture a cone sitting on a point, just waiting for a little bit of a breeze to tip it over. And so, you know, this particular case, looks like a bunch of, uh, I hate to say nihilists, I'm not really trying to criticize them per se, but on Reddit, you know, basically saying, who cares if we lose money, let's go hurt Wall Street. Um, and that, in this particular case, you know, happens to be the proximate cause for this, uh, uh, you know, ridiculous thing. And so what do they do? They drive the price of game stock up to abs apparently absurd levels. I, I'm not a analyst who follows that stock, but by all accounts, you know, the valuation's insane. And uh, so this does a couple of things. One, those that are short are, are forced as they're getting margin calls or their own internal risk limits are hit. They're forced to, to uh, get out of their trade, which means buying the shares. So the price goes even more. So buying begets buying and it's this feeding frenzy. And, um, uh, you know, uh, the price goes even higher. What's interesting is I haven't read anything about so, so GameStop is, is I'm sure, like all retailers, you know, really hurting due to the lockdowns. And, um, you know, like most companies that are at that size, uh, start probably a little starved for capital. Well, the share price has now gone ballistic. Do they have, are they taking advantage of this to raise capital and actually become a stronger, less bad, less marginal company? So, you know, if you feed enough capital even into a marginal company, you could give it a new lease on life or at least stave off, you know, if, if the thing was grinding its way down to zero and now you just whoop, shot it up here, you may give it another, who knows, five, ten years, I don't know. I haven't read anything about that. That would be an interesting thing. The broader picture is, of course, the Fed, in collusion with the banks, has been waging a war on interest for 40, 40 years, almost exactly 40 years to the day that the interest rate spiked in 1981. And um, as people are deprived of yield, they're forced to seek a surrogate, which is capital gains. And so they speculate. And so um, whatever happens to be going up at the moment, you know, the Bitcoin magic money machine is broken. Uh, that's not working anymore, producing magic money. So maybe GameStop and the speculators don't care. They just, whatever bubble is inflating, they want to be, they want to be early in on it and they want to be early to get out of it. And um, so GameStop today tomorrow will be a different story yeah and tomorrow i'm today actually the silver bugs are hoping that their reddit wall street bets are moving over into the silver space so my goodness there could really be some fireworks here if that's actually panning out to be true keith 
Um, now, Keith, let's let's start this conversation off today. Um, you coined this term "useless ingredients," and that's a great term, Keith, because what that is is exactly what it is: useless ingredients. You know, when I fill up my truck in the summertime, and I've got to pay more for that gas because it requires some useless ingredients that I don't care about. You know, that kind of is inflationary. That hurts my wallet. That I don't particularly like, because the concept here, Keith, that you have theorized is that um, you know. Over falling interest rates over the last several decades, that has shown us falling consumer prices as well because it um, – I can't remember the exact terminology and phrases you use, but it um, you know, stimulates malinvestment so that it's a race to the bottom with the prices because the person has to produce more. And I don't want to get into all that, but the point is – one of your main thesis is that useless ingredients is a major contributing factor to price inflation that we see. But my question for you, Keith, is are there other things now starting to happen other than useless ingredients that are contributing to price inflation that we see in the stores? For example, a couple of things that I could be thinking about are all these supply chain disruptions that we were told were temporary at the beginning of 2020, but in my opinion, seem to be worsening. That might be a thing. Another thing might be, um, has the money printed? and the debt monetization just reached a point where, you know, it's now got a floor under commodities and other consumer prices, and now the only inevitability is to rise. That might be a thing. A third thing could possibly be an increase in money velocity. You know, I've got, I want to talk about the, the brand new $20 bill in a little bit, but just to, to tease into that part of the interview that I want to get on with you, um, you know, if money velocity picks up, you know, I can imagine mattress money coming out of hiding and into the stores in anticipation of buying things ahead of rising prices. So I don't know how much of that made sense, Keith, but talk to us about useless ingredients, but the concept that possibly other things in addition to useless ingredients could be contributing to price inflation. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the concept of useless ingredients is basically differentiated between monetary forces that could be driving prices either up or down and non-monetary forces uh, and, and trying to address the, uh, the fallacy propagated by Milton Friedman who said inflation is everywhere a monetary uh, phenomenon. And I'm saying, well, look, if they force, if they force Exxon to put um, ethanol in the gasoline, then that forces the price of gasoline to go up. It has nothing to do with the Fed. Although people will measure it as inflation, people will see, say the CPI is X, the Fed in theory is supposed to change its policy based on that. What is the Fed supposed to do if the regulators are putting, what is 15 or 20 percent ethanol in, in gasoline? There's nothing, that, the Fed has no you know, leverage against that. So this year we had two, two different phenomena, both of which contributed to skyrocketing prices in their respective markets. So overall, I think consumer prices are are soft or falling, but um, you know, one being meat, um, you know, in April, May, June time frame, and that's because COVID fears, uh, you know, the Trump administration shut down. It was more than one. I don't remember how many meat packing plants it was. And then, of course, the conspiracy theories going wild. It's the Chinese that are you know running these disease-ridden meat packing plants. Um, so they shut down a bunch of meat packing plants. Interestingly. This caused the ranchers to have to slaughter very large numbers of animals uh, and, and lose money on it, uh, and while at the same time the price of meat was skyrocketing in the supermarkets. Um, and uh, so you have you know outright supply destruction, totally non-monetary, uh, you know regulatory effect, um, and uh, um, obviously you know skyrocketing consumer prices. And probably a reduction in supply. I mean, I imagine some of those ranchers went out of business or reduced their um, herd size, uh, you know, to, to deal with the sudden new risk that they, um, uh, you know, hadn't had before. But generally, a uh, certainly on the production side, um, a decline in profit margins. Right. So one of the key, if you look at the 1970s, you know, highly inflationary period versus now. What you see is expanding, ever expanding profit margins, because anybody who produces anything, you know, you buy the raw materials and you sit on them for six months before you manufacture them into finished goods. And during that time, the price of everything is going up. So margins are always expanding as, as interest rates are rising. And now, um, you know, on the, on the production side, you know, margins, margins collapsing. The other 
which we see in, in meat, but also I think toilet paper is probably the better example. I think most people said, oh, well, how stupid people are there. They're stocking up on toilet paper because that's what you need in the apocalypse. Ha ha. Um, and maybe there was some of that, but I think largely it was a shift in demand patterns um, and, and therefore a different product was demanded that goes through different channels. And that is um, when people are, are working every day, then a certain percentage of their, for lack of a better word, pooping is done, uh, you know, at the office or at work. All of a sudden, everybody's working at home or unemployed at home or whatever it is that people were uh, then and now, for that matter. Um, all the major employers, the offices are closed still. Um, and in a lot of places, the hotels are closed or their own skeleton crews. So, um, and people aren't uh, obviously occupying hotel rooms either. So, um, you know, if you look at a typical commercial restroom, you know, it's a very thin, single ply, very cheap, abrasive type of toilet paper, um, and usually comes on much larger rolls than like those those dispensers that we've all seen them in the stainless steel thing next to the toilet. And you know, the roll is like you know this diameter; it's, it's like twelve inches or something like that. And it's not packaged for individual consumption; it just has a paper wrapper on it. And those things must come in some sort of cardboard, you know, box, twenty of them or something like that, and they must buy them by the palletful, I would think. And uh, obviously, consumer toilet paper comes in a, it's not quite shrink wrap, it's a clear plastic thing that's some sort of heat glued thing. And uh, the individual rolls are much smaller, um, and uh, it's a different quality paper altogether. So all of a sudden, you have, you know, demand for the commercial stuff dropping. 80 90 percent and so whoever had equipment and plant tooled up to manufacture that is uh you know basically piling up with inventory they can't sell and then the consumer stuff is flying off the shelves they can't possibly stock it anymore and um the people you know the, the tooling that makes the commercial stuff can't easily be you know the capital isn't really fungible the capital is a fixed investment in that particular kind of product and so um you know, the price of the toilet paper skyrockets and you can't get it. And then what the stores tried to do was instead of instead of engaging in a practice that most people feel should be illegal, which is quote unquote gouging, then they just said rationing instead. They just said you can only buy, you know, two. And of course when you went to the grocery store you couldn't buy any because the price was too cheap relative to the demand. And so you couldn't get any. And I don't know what people did, uh, you know, during the worst of that. But um you know, so so those are two uh, uh, very non-monetary forces. I wouldn't exactly call them useless ingredients, yet. You know, pri pri prices in those two markets skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, and also in you know semiconductor chips and stuff like that, we're seeing like you know automobile manufacturers they're having to shut down production on certain models because there's you know for, I don't know, for lack of a better word a shortage of chips um also like for example with GameStop right we talked about GameStop earlier you can't buy an Xbox the brand new Xbox or a brand new PlayStation on GameStop right that should be the bread and butter but it's simply not available but you can buy them all day on rebay except you know instead of $499 the retail price you got to pay over $700 to get that in the real world um so i just find those dynamics interesting because you know my point there is it seems like we're starting to see other pressures starting to come in and have an increase on the general level of prices so i guess just the question is so you still think we're in an era of falling prices even with these other um um dynamics that we've just discussed here correct yeah i mean well number one i imagine that they'll get the meat plants back online i don't it's hard to predict because that's more political than economic what's going to happen with these things uh, but I imagine they'll get that sorted, and clearly the toilet paper manufacturers have either built more or whatever. But I continue to see the interest rate falling. And with every downtick in the interest rate, there's a fresh new incentive to add more production capacity. So how, in an environment that is constantly increasing the incentive to, to add capacity, our price is going to remain uh, and high. And the other thing I'll say about things like... Um, you know, when, uh, when when lockdown happened, everybody had to buy a laptop and a webcam. So the question is, is that going to drive prices up or is that kind of a one-time surge that's more in the pulling demand forward category rather than a durable 
you know, because obviously the prices of laptops and webcams, same thing. You couldn't get them, and on eBay, they're you know, double what the, you know, double or triple MSRP. Is that a is that a one time thing, versus um, is that uh, you know a, a a durable new force in the economy? And and I would, I would think that uh, that's not durable. That that's a pulling forward of demand. And then actually, when you get to the other side of it. You know the companies that have expanded their production to, to support that surge. If they did, if they, you know, I don't know that Intel built new plants, uh, you know, or Microchip or whoever builds those that you know builds the plants to make the chips. I don't know if they have built new plants for that, and uh, I would caution them against doing that because I think, um, you know, you'd be making a big investment for something that you know demand surge that may may be fleeting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Keith, um, let's talk about the concept of digital assets for a minute here, because it's very interesting, Keith, because, you know, I, I, I didn't look, I don't know if Janet Yellen went before the House uh, Financial Services Committee or whatever it's exactly called, but when she was before the Senate Committee, you know, that testimony of her public commentary is 114 pages long. And including that and her statement, not one time did the word gold come up. So they can never, ever discuss gold. But this is interesting, Keith. She did, in fact, discuss digital assets. And in my opinion, she's like giving digital assets like um, credence. But see, I think that's wrong because I want to just ask you, like, what even is a digital asset? Well, I mean, like some MP3s on a flash drive, that could be argued a digital asset, right? Or if you've got like, um, you know, V-Bucks to buy some skins or some weapons in Fortnite. I mean, I know I've given, a, you know, a comma, maybe five digits worth of, no, I don't think five digits, but definitely, you know, four digits worth of money to Epic Games for my son buying all these in-game purchases. So, you know, that virtual money could be actually used for something, but you know, I see Bitcoin as like a digital liability, right? Because you got to ever expand the the ledger. You've got to have all that ever expanding computer processing power. You've got to have network connectivity and you can't really do anything with it other than trade it back and forth, which requires all those things. So my point there, and I'm running around in circles probably again, but you know, by Janet Yellen talking about digital assets, she's kind of trying to keep people gated into this dollar-based system, this dollar-based financial system that can be taxed, that can be tracked, that can be seized, all of these different things at once. Um, but I, when, when she says digital asset, I think a digital asset um, is is kind of like the dollar in that it's an ersatz money, but it's not really money. I don't know how any of that made any sense at all, but talk to us about Janet Yellen, digital assets, and things like this, Keith. So um, you're right. They don't talk about gold. And um, I've met with and, and had conversations with a number of central bankers, not just in the U.S., but globally, not at the level of Yellen, but one and, and two levels down. And um, they don't think about gold. It's not in their worldview. It's not something that um, really enters their their consciousness. It's not important to them. And to the extent that they think of it, they might think, well, okay, if gold goes up and people sell it, then they have to pay capital gains tax. So it's all good. And in the same sense, the same thing is true for Bitcoin. Anybody who bought Bitcoin at $3,000 and sold it at $43,000 is um, a $40,000 capital gain. So Uncle Sam says, yeah, give me. Uh, I, don't, I don't think they care other, other than that. But um, they're thinking about a couple of things, I think, a lot. One is, uh, and I wrote about this years ago, I was at um, the Monetary Policy Conference at the Cato Institute. I want to say that it must have been in 2014, because at that time, there hadn't been any hiking of interest rates. In 20, by, the, by, by November of 2015, there was discussion of it. So it must have been 2014. And um, they all, in that room at least, and at that time, obviously, uh, um, you know, a lot of the Fed was still, uh, you know, Bush appointees. So the, the difference between the Republicans and the Democrats, the, the, the Republicans are monetarists and the Democrats are Keynesians. And um, like two warring tribes, one, you know, ties their belt one way and the other one ties the belt, you know, it's over this versus this. And they see each other and, you know, they think they're, totally opposite and they want to kill each other. And, uh, the monetarists and the Keynesians aren't all, all that different. So uh, it was clear to me in that room that everybody accepted the idea of a, a, a Taylor rule, you know, named for um, Professor at uh, uh, Stanford, I believe. Um, 
And John Taylor was actually there, and he, and he spoke about it. They were all in the same playbook. And that purports to tell them what the right interest rate is based on some magic incantate, you know, incantation of numerology. And um, they all agreed, oh, yeah, you know, Bernanke should have, you know, the very respectful chairman Bernanke should have, you know, increased the interest rate by 50 basis points, you know, six months ago. And, um, you know, they all reiterated that. And several, of, I, I don't know why Chairman Bernanke hasn't done it yet. Meanwhile, that was while I was working on my theory of interest and prices and, and um, you know, kind of thinking about the idea that it's like falling into a black hole, that when you get past a certain point, there's the, you know, so here's the black hole, but there's this event horizon, um, which, by the way, I was reading a thing recently, completely random, but it's interesting. The event horizon on a big black hole, it's like a light year. It's not like you, know, you think the sun and the earth, 90 million miles. No, no, no. If you get within a light year of it, you're going to be forced to, to crash into it. Wow. So I was thinking, okay, if the interest rate gets below the event horizon, wherever that may be, then necessarily it's going to crash into zero. And um, then listening to all these people, and, and some of them were, uh, I want to say it was, um, no, no, Dick Fisher wasn't there. It was Evans was there, and one or two other um one other um, um, regional Fed presidents, and then there were some other um, uh, uh, top-level folks that were there, and um, they were all completely puzzled as to why Bernanke wasn't raising rates. And it clicked for me. It's because he knows he can't. And he's so terrified. It's like the Wizard of Oz. You know, you think he's this great, powerful thing, and then when uh, the dog Toto you know, tugs back the curtain, and it's just a hunched over little, little old man with a the bullhorn um you, you know he's terrified that uh or was terrified that anybody would discover how powerless he was that the interest rate was going down due to forces outside of his control or understanding and um you know how destructive is that anyways the point of this whole long um uh, diversion is that the central bankers are very much thinking about what happens when you hit uh, they call it the zero bound um what happens when interest rates go negative and, uh, you know, look at this in light of 1933, people were withdrawing their uh, uh, cash from the banks in 1930. And those days, cash meant gold coin, right? So it wasn't a purchase of gold. It was a redemption of your paper to get the gold money out. And um, he stopped the run on the banks by making it illegal to possess gold. The purpose wasn't really to grab loot, although I'm sure that pleased him. The purpose was to stop the run on the banks. And so once he did that, there's no real reason to prefer paper cash over, um, you know, over a bank deposit anymore. And so that ended the run on the banks, and there hasn't really been a run since. But when interest rates go negative, and it has, to, and there's a certain threshold, right? If it's one basis point, you know, one one hundredth of a percent, I don't think that really motivates anybody to do anything. But when it gets to a certain point, uh, and so in Switzerland, for instance, it's minus zero point seven five percent is what you get on your deposit. So you put deposit 100, you get back 99.25 um, at the end of the year. Um, I know somebody who's involved in the vaulting business. Um, they have one of those old mountain tunnel complexes from World War II, um, and they've retrofit it with security and dehumidifiers and whatever. Uh, they do have clients that are bringing in tractor trailers of pallets of 1,000-franc uh, notes to, to store because the cost of all of that printing and pallets and trucking and everything is lower than what they're losing on their deposit um, and the storage cost, you know, too, and the insurance cost for that. So, um, but that's just the irredeemable about, currency too, isn't it, Keith? The Swiss is. franc? Isn't the Swiss franc an irredeemable currency too? It is. Yeah. Anyway, keep so, going. Keep going. Uh, so anyways, um, uh, so when, when interest rates go negative enough, then people are going to turn to cash, which will then re recreate the run on the banks that we saw, you know, before 1933. And then they're terrified of that. They have, they know they have to do something to stop that, and so they're left with either find some way to make the um, the paper note degrade, not in its purchasing power. That's not the issue here. In its nominal amount, make some way that if you have a twenty dollar bill tomorrow, it's nineteen dollars and ninety nine cents, and the day after that is nine you know, $19.98. I'm not sure how you would do that with paper bills. Uh, I guess when, when you, 
spend the paper bill, maybe there's some sort of scanner that looks at its serial number and then tells you, oh, that's not a 20, that's a 1972. Um, I don't know if that would really work. Or the other thing you can do is you can force people not to use paper anymore. You can say, well, everybody has up to a certain date to deposit all their paper. After that, paper is no longer legal tender. And everything after that has to be some sort of electronic uh, deposit, some sort of digital currency issued by the Fed or the Fed's you know, uh, banking cartel or whatever. Um, but you're going to be forced out of uh, you know, safety and back into... Um, I shouldn't say safety, out of the relatively safe haven from nominal degradation of the currency into something that we, if we say the interest rate is minus 1%, we can take 1% and there's nothing you could do about it because you can log in and you can process and weep. Um, so that's one thing they're thinking about because at this point, I think they all do know that interest rates are falling out of control and that it's only a matter of time. You can plot the trajectory when does it go negative? And um, so that's the first issue. The second one is around so-called anti-money laundering um, regulation. And um, I'm just old enough to remember when, you know, when America used to be more like, I don't know, I'll just use the term free country, um, where, you know, there, there, was, there, was, there, were, there were constitutional, uh, you know, cases before the Supreme Court that there was no such thing as a duty to report a crime. You couldn't be imprisoned for the sole crime of not reporting a crime. Now, if you were an accomplice to a different story, if you aided and abetted a different story, but if you just were aware of something and chose not to report it, that the government didn't have a crime that they could charge you with. But sometime, and, and, and to my awareness, it seems to be around uh, you know, 9-11, we, we, we completely inverted it. And so all um, it, you know, it begins with financial institutions, but it's creeping out from there. Um, I mean, you see it with um, with Bloomberg, you know, Mayor Bloomberg in New York City saying it's illegal to, um, uh, you know, to sell uh, uh, soft drinks larger than a certain size. You see it with laws that say bartenders are, are supposed to shut somebody off if they're you know, visibly drunk. Um, you know, more and more, they want to hold some business accountable for what the actions of their customers might be. And actually, not only that, but actually deputize them to go and look for it. Not only that, that they have to look for pre-crime. In other words, it's not that the person who has done anything wrong, it's that the person might be able to do something wrong. And then not only is, the, uh, is this um, you know, private corporation deputized to do this, they must do it at their own expense and not only at their own expense, at their own liability, meaning that there are very serious consequences if they fail to find somebody who then later goes to commit a crime that, you know, they can then be, you know, held, um, you know, certainly, um, um, you know, big financial penalties and maybe even criminal, depending on what it is. So that is, that has become a paradigm shift in how everybody in finance, both on the government regulatory side and in the industry, you know, think about, um, opening client accounts and, and all of that. And, um, you know, to the point where, uh, well, to the point where Peter Schiff is, is dragged on to 60 minutes um, and they're demanding to know why some guy who opened an account at his bank in Puerto Rico was allowed to open an account and, um, you know, had, had something to do with drugs. And I don't know whether he had one, one dose of one drug 20 years ago, whether he was dealing them, but then suddenly that becomes... Peter's problem, um, and and all the you know the the, the crowds are, are 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 cheering. This is you know this is righteous, you know. So, anyways, now you have Bitcoin, which um, seemingly offers anonymity, um, which actually is a whole different thing because although you know nobody knows who owns the wallet, if they're clever and if they're diligent, all they have to do is look for one hint that can tie that wallet to your identity or your bank account. And even if you're really, really careful, even if you're really, really paranoid, and even if you really, really know what you're doing, just ask Ross Ulbricht, a.k.a. Dread Pirate Roberts, what happens when somebody with enough resources decides to try to tie that wallet to you, then they can, and every transaction you've ever done since inception is indelibly there in the blockchain for them to audit and look at, oh, you bought this, you bought that. Um, so it isn't exactly anonymity, but 
um, the regulators are looking at what if you had an anonymous means of payment, then that would mean that all of their um, deputizing financial intermediaries to look for pre-crime would be out the window. Uh, so then they think, well, you know, what if we could, I, I call it copying the face, but not the heartbeat. What if we could issue a, a Fed coin that would be just like Bitcoin? And I, I imagine, I mean, I'm not that plugged into the, the Reddit, uh, you know, threads for Bitcoin, but I can just imagine that exactly no one in the Bitcoin community would be impressed by that uh, or would trust them for a, a New York second. Um, but I think that's what they're thinking about. Thirdly, there's one other thing that, um, that I think is driving it, and that is there is a desperate need by the Fed to relentlessly expand um, uh, credit. Um, you know, catastrophe happens if credit isn't allowed to expand. And that's because, and I've written tons about this, um, you know, the dollar is an irredeemable currency, which means you can never pay off a debt, and the interest accrues, and that's added to the debt, and that can't be paid off either. So every debtor, if you owe a million dollars and the interest rate on your debt is 3%, you must find $30,000 somehow, somewhere uh, in order to service that debt. Otherwise, the bank comes and takes your farm and chances are most small business owners have signed a personal guarantee so they take your house and your life savings in addition to your farm. Um, so everyone is desperately um, you know, producing whatever they can in order to dump it in the market in order to get the, the cash. Anyways, the Fed has to ensure that the marginal debtor, not just the Treasury, the Treasury would be the least marginal debtor, the Fed has to ensure that the marginal debtor is, uh, is, is getting a sufficient you know, the, the credit is pumping out at a sufficient rate to reach even the periphery. Um, and uh, as the arteries become, I don't know, overextend my analogy, the arteries become clogged, uh, that becomes harder and harder to do. So, you know, they incentivize the banks to lend by saying, okay, well, we'll relax the reserve requirements and we'll, um, you know, make, make the, the cost of credit cheaper and cheaper and cheaper when that's not sufficient. And I think we're either at or very close to that point then the Fed may want to take more direct action and pumping credit out uh, and, and not, not trying to push on the strings of the banking system, but to force it, force it out at pressure. And um, a Fed coin is uh, probably just a ticket to enable them to do that. Uh, and, and they're doing that to keep, the, to keep going. Um, and the moment they stop, uh, there will be horrific, catastrophic consequences. So, so... Obviously, this is under, unsustainable, but it sounds like what I'm hearing is that, um, you know, it might not necessarily take the shape of UBI, right, as opposed to, because you're talking about extending credit as opposed to just some sort of universal universal basic income. Here's your allotment of Fed coins for the month. That's the first question. And then the second question is a lot of people seem to think this is going to be building up to the Great Reset or some sort of reset or something like that. So, in addition to that first question, just about, you know, you're talking about extending credit as opposed to UBI with the Fed coin. And then also, what are your thoughts on this whole great reset thing that everybody keeps chatting about from time to time? Well, the first thing uh, I'll answer is the um, UBI versus credit thing. If if the government wants to give, I don't know, $2,000 free to every man, woman, and child on the planet, then Congress just simply passes the legislation and um, you know we're now in a mode where clearly both parties love it. The more the better. You know Trump Trump did 2.8 trillion dollars of CARES Act. Um, now Biden did 1.9 trillion on his first go at it. It's clear he's going to do more. We don't know how much more. So if the government just wants to dole it out, uh, you know they can. And there's already a, a time time proven method for doling out free goodies. Um, but the Fed. Fed is like a bank. I mean, it, in some ways, it's very different. But, you know, think of a bank. A bank doesn't just give out free money. It's a loan. Um, and uh, even though the, the borrowers are net aren't repaying the principal, they're servicing it. And um, so the, the Fed just has to make sure that, um, that it remains solvent. And so the value of its asset has to be greater than the value of its liability if that ever inverts. And, and also that means that the income interest income that it gets on its assets, its portfolio of loans and bonds, um, has to be greater than its interest expense, which is what it's paying to the banks 
for all those uh, deposits that are parked there. Uh, if that ever inverts, then um, you know th then there's big trouble. And I think that that's how our um, Weimar moment, our Zimbabwe moment, moment, um, you know, will likely occur is when the Fed. So what the Fed's been doing up until now, and and now it's, it's starting to change because they're buying all kinds of defaulted mortgages. Um, and so that's now rubbish. That's, you know, they buy it at par to keep the, the, the seller, keep the bank solvent. Uh, but that's that's rubbish. That's not an asset or, or it's an asset that's worth 30 cents on the dollar. Who knows what? Uh, but as long as the Fed, so let's say up till COVID, as long as the Fed is buying good assets, then one shouldn't really think of it as printing. One should think of it as borrowing. So when the Fed issues the currency, it's borrowing from everybody who demands what we call money. Um, and everybody argues the dollar is money, even the Austrians. I've gotten into big arguments about that. Um, that is the dollar money. Well, they believe it's money. So everybody who demands money is the Fed's creditor willingly, eagerly extending credit to the Fed uh, to finance the cred buy Fed buying an asset. And as long as the asset has a higher interest rate than whatever the Fed is paying to its creditors, then um, you know there, there are lots and lots of horrible consequences to that. Don't get me wrong. I'm not in any way saying it's good. It's bad. A hundred ways bad. But it's not a hyperinflationary collapse. And so that's why all of the Predictions of hyperinflationary collapses over the last 12 years have not come true. But when the Fed begins to print, not to buy good assets, but to subsidize the negative cash flow. So let's say the Fed is borrowing at you know 25 basis points or whatever it is now, uh, and they're buying assets that have zero, or they're parking away in some hidden unaudited corner of their balance sheet. Um, and now they have a negative cash flow because interest expense going out the door, but they're not getting interest on these defunct assets. And so they start to print that is getting deeper and deeper into debt and incurring more and more interest expense for something that isn't earning for them, then that's your death spiral. And I uh, you know that might take a few years. Once that begins, that might take a few years. You know, these things always take longer than you think they will. And I, I credit Adam Smith for having the foresight to say there's a great deal of ruin in a nation. You have ruinous policy, but it doesn't turn to ruin instantly. It always takes time, and it's because there's a lot of wealth that they're that they're consuming um, in the process. So that was the first half of your question. I what was the second half? I apologize. About is this leading up to the Great Reset, or what is this leading up to? Like thoughts well, it's, on it's the a, Great Reset, or just a reset? It's a destruction of capital, and I I think there's a tendency, um, you know, for for people in the gold and silver community to think. Everything is going to be the same. It's just that all those idiot fat cats, are, you know, currently fat cats, are going to be out in the gutter, um, you know, sipping a bottle out of a brown paper bag, and I'm going to be the fat cat in the back of that limousine or in that Ferrari. But um, you know, so it's kind of like a neutron bomb that you know leaves the capital standing, but you know, sort of kills the current people at the top, and you know, we're going to replace them. Um, I don't think that's really right. I I think. I think of this whole thing as a process of consuming capital. That is all of this accumulated stuff that enhances our productivity. We don't work any harder than they did, you know, in Adam Smith's day in the late 18th century. Um, we don't work any harder than they did in the ancient world, you know, 5,000 years ago. In fact, we work less hard. Um, and we sit in, you know, in comfortable chairs and air conditioning and have heating and stuff and, you know, type. And even the people that work physically have enormous leverage from machines. You know, they have um, diesel motors and all these things. Um, and the reason why we're so much more productive is capital we've accumulated. And that is what we're now decumulating. That's what this process is. It's a process of converting all of that accumulated savings, converting that to, to income, and then either doling it out or incentivizing people to consume it, uh, which is what um, speculative bubbles do. And when we run out, I mean, you can see in Venezuela, their ability to produce oil has collapsed. One of the most oil rich deposits, you know, geographically in the world, and they can't produce oil. Um, their electric grid has basically failed um, and collapsed. And then, it would, you know, it would have to be rebuilt from scratch. It's not at the point where it can be repaired anymore. I've read articles about this and 
like electrical engineering kind of things, um, you can't produce anymore. So what happens when we cannot produce energy uh, and food? And of course, food production requires energy production. You know, I live in Phoenix here. There's no water without electricity. It's all pumped. Um, when the electricity turns off, that's it. I mean, you can't live in Phoenix anymore. Now, X, whatever, three, four million people have to leave all at once. And how's that going to work out? And what's going to happen on the road? And I mean, you know, invent your scenario, picture whatever scenario you choose. Uh, but this will be a killing zone. Um, and so it'll just be a collapse of the ability to produce. And, um, you know, on the current trajectory, you know, modern industrial technological civilization shuts down and um, the survivors, because obviously there will be a great catastrophic event, but after that, the survivors now have to earn a living off the soil using, you know, at best 18th century agriculture, except nobody has mules and nobody has plowshares and nobody has seeds and nobody has the knowledge that everybody in the 18th century would have had once. So that's, that's what we're looking at. So this is, first of all, not something to be cheered, even if you own gold and even if, even if the price of gold in nominal dollar terms goes to a million dollars, isn't going to be a good thing. Um, and, uh, uh, and so I, so I think reset is really, um, at best a euphemism. And that's where we're that. So that, so that eventuality that you're describing is the eventuality that we're heading to. We're, there's no question. That's the current trajectory mm -hmm. is by every means possible. They have to incentivize the, the liquidation of more capital in order to keep the game going. Um, because we have so much wealth destroying enterprise that, um, you know, if that is allowed to collapse, all those people are laid off that work in it and all the debts that those wealth destroying enterprises are servicing um, will default and those defaults will then ripple through and hit the financial intermediaries and then they suddenly find they're insolvent and they default and the whole irredeemable currency thing, you know, falls. So that's what they're trying to stave off. But in staving off, it's just more and more consumption of more and more capital. There's a finite end. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, now it let's doesn't stick go on forever. Let, let, so let's stick with this for, for, for a minute here, Keith, because, you know, um, the concept of the crack up boom, I'm probably confusing when confusing myself when I say this, but, you know, I go to Walmart and certain items are never in stock and the shelves are always less than half full. And I don't go to just like one Walmart. I go to the Walmarts in a, you know, a city of over, I don't live in that city, but the closest city to me has over 200,000 people. Um, and, and, you know, there's quite a few different Walmarts in there and I'm seeing less and less stuff on the shelves all the time. So is this part of that capital destruction that you're seeing that money is just chasing things and people are realizing that, you know, this, this 400 gram bar of saute soap has 66% purity, 66% fatty acid. So I could just take my dollar that I have and buy this right here. And then I'm consuming that capital. Am I thinking of that correctly? Because my question is, you know, has the crack up boom started, um, on main streets. Um, and then to follow that one step further, does that also mean that people, something will click, right? And then they'll end up starting to front run rising prices by buying more. And then all of a sudden you get the buying, it gets buying as well. So um, also as a way to possibly sense that there's this currency crisis developing. So that's another motive to buy. So, so you know, on and also bringing in um, the fact that you know, it's also a way to opt out of these dollars because I don't really want to hold them because they're losing value. Am I thinking about any of that right? And what would you add on to that, Keith? Um, I mean, that's, that's certainly the, the nature of a crack-up boom is when people decide to dump their dollars and buy whatever merchandise they can. Um, are but, you seeing signs of that? And how are the stores in Phoenix? Uh, um. I, 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 well, yeah, there's certainly an issue in, in, in certain kinds of things where the shelves are, are thinly stocked. Um, but I think, I think that's a different phenomenon. And I think for, for not, not for Walmart, for most stores, getting the capital to even stock the shelf is difficult. But also, buying habits are changing and more and more buying is going online, um, you know, to the point where the retailers are really, uh, they they don't want to get stuck with too much merchandise, and then when when the pro, when that becomes obsolete or the fashion changes or whatever, then they get stuck, um, which is actually kind of the opposite of the crack up boom. Nobody wants to get stuck with merchandise. In the crack up boom, 
you would go out and buy 50 pairs of ladies size five shoes because that's at least a real good and eventually somebody you know you'll find a woman who wants to buy it whereas um you know think about what an incredible distortion that is how inefficient that is economically for people to want to um load up wheelbarrows full of size five lady shoes um and and how distorted things would have to be to make that seem like an attractive thing no i think right now uh everybody is still trying to service their debts so i think another sign would be when people just say you know beep it i don't care anymore um and then all the debts are effectively repu repudiated it's it's the debt and the servicing of the debt that holds everything up and and right now i don't see people repudiating the debt not like that um and i don't think that um you know, right now, I think there's still plenty of capital to burn. And as the interest rate falls, you see, you know, more, more capacity. I, I, I see around here in Phoenix, they're still building new shopping centers and shopping capacity. And, and you know, you go to the old shopping center and there used to be one section of the parking lot that was acres of parking lot. And now suddenly they're putting in more, um, you know, shopping buildings and, and restaurant buildings. And, uh, and hotels uh, and, and all of these things. So the capital is still apparently plentiful. The party is still on. Um, and, uh, you know, um, so it goes for a while longer. The other thing is, of course, I've written a lot about gold backwardation. And I think that will be an early warning sign of, you know, hyperinflationary collapse. And there's no sign of that right now. In fact, the, ba the gold basis is abnormally high. Uh, and the silver basis even more so. So uh, there isn't that scarcity in the precious metals at the moment. I think that, um, you know, as we were talking about Bitcoin earlier, people are just looking for whatever bubble is is inflating and they want to dive in on it. And then, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of Elliott Wave I don't agree with, but one of the things I do agree with is that sometimes the price action can actually either drive or even create the narrative. You know, Bitcoin's going to 50,000. Therefore, everyone's questioning, you know, the, the dollar as such. Not quite. Now, Keith, uh, last major topic of discussion here. Um, because, you know, I think that, you know, there's now chatter, right? Uh, Biden's press secretary, Jen Psaki, or I don't know how to pronounce her last name. But, you know, she said that they're looking to speed up the introduction of the um twenty dollar harriet tubman note right and since like the mm -hmm. 1800s it's been the andrew da jackson right so nobody alive today has known any other twenty dollar bill right the dollar coins never caught on right the presidential coins the sacagawea is none of that stuff ever caught on so there's in my mind some psychological issues right by having this new money is it worth the same why is it new why is it changed right um that's point number one point number two is you know what happens if the government comes out and says, okay, here's the new Harriet Tubman, right? So we're going to say that all the Andrew Jacksons, those have to be turned into a bank or those have to be spent by X number of days. So that brings that mattress money out of the out, out of hiding and into the stores or into the banks. Um, I would think that it would go into the stores because people see rising consumer prices in the stores. Um, so I guess my point there is, and also when you think about the penny, right? Think about the penny. It costs more than a penny to mint a penny, and it doesn't even have the same copper content anymore. So why is the penny still around? Why don't we do like the Canadians and just get rid of all together? So I think there's a major psychological thing that's about to happen here. Um, and I think that if you believe, and I do, that the Fed and the government both chronically understate inflation for the purposes of, you know, not paying out pensioners as much and saying, well, we're close to our symmetrical 2% target, but geez, we're just not quite there yet. So all of these dynamics are swirling around. And I think that this could be sort of one of these aha moments that could spark some monetary velocity, and especially if inflation has been chronically understated by way of policy, then people looking for the inflation and looking for the money velocity, they might miss it because since it's been understated for so long, you know, the way they change, they measure hedonics or the way they change the calculation and in measuring inflation and things like this by way of policy. So 
I, I'm rambling on again there, Keith, but just do you think, think that any of these things could have a psychological impact? Because they talk about it being a confidence game with a dollar. So do you see any issues with confidence or anything that I said bringing on any confidence issues with the dollar here, Keith? I, you know, in my, in my view, what holds the dollar up isn't some great big illusion of, or confidence, but it's the struggles of the which, which is real. I mean, if you don't service your debt, they take, they take everything you have. And so everybody who's in debt, which is every productive business just about, is frantically producing whatever they can and dumping it on the bid price, which is what's, what, that's what keeps prices so soft. Nobody's in a position to, to not do that. You know, in the, in the 1970s, as, as a period, everybody was borrowing more in order to increase their inventory and slow down the rate. And so they, they, can, they were buying at a faster rate of their raw materials and selling their finished goods at a slower rate because the more you stretched out the time, you know, so not only did you have a big uh, inventory of raw materials, but if it took 27 steps in your production process, you had a buffer of inventory in between each of, you know, 26 inventory buffers of par each partially completed stage. It, were, there were warehouses of the stuff. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't see, I don't, I don't see that today. Now, so the Harriet Tubman, uh, you know, replacing Andrew Jackson on the 20, um, there certainly have been any number of changes to the, you know, how the, how the 20 appears. They haven't changed the president on it. Um, but, you know, they've added the magnetic threads, they've added all kinds of other things. Um, and I, to my knowledge, they've never declared any previous iteration of it um, not to be legal tender after a certain date. The, Sw the Swiss do that, by the way. Every time they have a new version of the currency, everybody has a certain period of time to um, get with the program and trade the old ones in for the new ones. And if you miss the boat, then you, you know, you've lost all monetary value. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know whether they would declare all the Andrew Jacksons to be not legal tender. Uh, I guess if they did, um, then people would want to spend them or deposit them or whatever. Because I'm thinking if, if they're looking to spark inflation, then that's one thing that they would be able to get that inflation. If they say, hey, you got to spend these Andrew Jacksons for the end of the year because they're not going to be worth it anymore because they're not going to be legal tender. Yeah, but I don't. I mean, my view of inflation, I guess, is different than that. I, I see it as a race between supply and demand rather than, you know, an increase in demand per se. So, you know, my favorite example is we buy more of these now than ever. And the price, you know, it's interesting. I mean, you say hedonic adjustment. And I've written this article, came to my mind when you said that, comparing a Honda, uh, a Honda Accord 30 years ago. I think I wrote this in 2017 or something like that. So comparing like a 1987 Honda Accord to a 2017 Honda Accord. And uh, the 1987 was like 102 horsepower. Um, and, uh, you know, the 2017 was, you know, whatever, 240 horsepower. And uh, the 1987 had AM radio, and this one has, you know, DVD sat nav, and, you know, on and on and on with things, and saying, there's a lot more stuff in that car. You know, there's, you know, 18,000 airbags in it, and there's sensors and cameras and, you know, all these things, right, that um, the old one didn't have. And yeah, obviously the price has gone up, but how do you, how do you even compare? It's not, it's not apples to oranges, even though you could say that's one average or median, um, you know, middle class four door, you know, family car. Um, and uh, the same thing with the phones, you know, this particular phone is, you know, probably, well, the price has come down now, probably a six or $700 phone, but it has four processors and you know, 64 uh, gigabits, of, uh, gigabits of RAM, or 64? No, it's 128 of, of hard storage. RAM, I think, is 16 um, gigabytes. And, you know, what it's capable of and the resolution of the screen and all that. This is really quite an amazing technological device that has a lot more in it than the phone that I bought, you know, three years ago, which had a lot more in it than the one, you know, two or three years before that and so on. Um, but the prices are soft on these things, even so. Um, and, you know, what I see now being advertised, Verizon saying, come in and we'll give you this, 
looks like an even better deal than this one's about two years old already, I think. So I, 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 I don't think it's just a matter of spending. It's a matter of what's going on in the interest rate environment. And the only way I can describe that is I think there's very soft demand for credit other than when the interest rate ticks down. The only way to get people to borrow more is by offering it even cheaper. So there's a lot of people at the margin that don't want to borrow whatever the rate is. When you tick it down one, you win the marginal borrower you know, to add to credit. And that's why you know, if you go to buy a car, every car company is offering 0% for 72 months. Um, and some of them are 0% for 84 months. It's just incredible. And um, as long as you have that environment, if there's an uptick in spending on whatever consumer goods people choose to spend their Andrew Jackson's on, um, then as long as that's being met with an increase in supply, then um, you know it doesn't necessarily drive prices up. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as to, as to Tubman on the twenty per se, you know, I think it's obviously it's very political, and you know, you know, given the given the events of George Floyd and all everything that's been going on since then, I can see why certain political uh, uh, forces are pushing for that. But I imagine to most people, it's a twenty. And they just get used to it and they say, okay, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, you know, to me as a gold guy, whoever's picture they put on this counterfeit credit thing that they call money, <laughs> it doesn't matter anyway. It's just irredeemable paper. Very interesting. Very interesting. Because how do you explain the penny, though? How do you explain the penny, though? That's also, is that psychological in nature? Why are they still producing pennies if it costs more than a penny to make a penny? You know, yeah, and I think it is psychological, and I think nobody in the government wants to be the guy who says, you know, the penny has become so worthless, we might as well pull it. Then everyone's going to be like, kill him! You know, it's like kill the messenger. Um, so, you know, these things take on an institutional inertia that um, there's so many things we do that if they ever once made sense, certainly don't anymore today. And yet... Um, you know, there's all these blue laws every once in a while you see, oh yeah, you know, in New Jersey, um, you have to have two people with lanterns walking ahead of your car and two people behind, you know, if you're driving on a Sunday or something like that, and that's to whatever. I'm not even sure that ever made sense in 1910 when they created that law, but it's certainly absurd today. And yet, you know, there it is. Or the Fed has uh, 8,000 tons of gold, or say the treasury, but it's being stored at the Fed. Why? Because nobody wants to be the politician that says, oh, I want to be Gordon Brown and I want to dump it at the bottom. Mm-hmm. If you're a politician, that would be career suicide. So so why why touch it? So it'll just go on until it can't go on anymore. Extend and pretend. Or, um... oh. Now, Keith, we've talked about a lot today. Um, you know, As we move through winter here, just like, is there one or two things that's on your radar the most? Because, you know, I know... You know, hopefully this pandemic's coming to an end finally. I hope that they're starting to ease restrictions, although they're increasing the travel restrictions once again. Brand new travel restrictions just went into effect for flying into the country and on the 26th. So, like, or like, is there something on your radar, like, as far as, you know, all of these stimulus and how many are we going to have this year? Or is it the wild speculation in the markets? Or just what's one thing that's on your radar the most as we're moving through winter here, Keith? The one thing I just want to say about this, that we have a vaccine for COVID now, and the distribution is being centrally planned. And uh, number one, you know, everybody wants it to be centrally planned. Nobody would tolerate it if they said, well, let's just let Pfizer make whatever they can make and sell it to rich people. And um, the purpose of the central planning is not efficiency. If they wanted efficiency, they'd let Pfizer go to work. The purpose is to force Pfizer not to make too much money and to force the rich not to get vaccinated too quickly. Um, so, who knows how long it's going to take for everybody to get vaccinated. And in the meantime, you know, we could see more cycles of lockdown. And every time you lock businesses down, I, you know, I can only imagine being a restaurant owner, a bar owner, a boutique clothing store owner. You know, it's like you're, you're reeling from this punch. And then you think, OK, we're finally through it. Um, I can tap my family for a little bit more money. We could buy some new inventory and clean up and reopen and then, you know, wham, just another gut punch. 
Um, I, I have to think for as many businesses as we've destroyed with lockdown so far, there's going to be many, many more. And I think that, um, no, so not only is that sector going to be horrible, but commercial real estate um, at every level from retail to, um, I'm sorry, my uh, phone is ringing here, every level from retail to um, even offices, as every major employer says, well, how big an office do we really need? So I see a train wreck coming in, um, uh, in all the bonds and loans related to real estate um, and where are those defaults going to hit? And the Fed is going to probably onboard all that. Um, and then that further, you know, further accelerates the, the, the coming currency crisis. And at the same time that the government is saying, hey, you know, it's now been proven neither party cares about deficits. I mean, Dick Cheney infamously said that he was testing the water as a trial balloon. Deficits don't matter. Well, I think Trump proved it. You know, if you have a, um, a cause that everybody says they can believe in, which is COVID relief, you could spend $2.8 trillion on top of there's already a $1.7 trillion deficit before that point. And then, you know, so now you're at four and a half, plus obviously major tax shortfalls, I assume, five plus trillion dollar deficit. So now we're in the era of, you know, deficits in the mid single digit trillions. I'm old enough to remember under Bush Jr., a $400 billion deficit, and people are like, oh, my God. And now we're at, you know, $4 trillion plus. So that's worrying, and it, cause it accelerates, you know, Armageddon. I mean, we're racing towards something bad, and um, we get closer to it, and that's why, as you may know, uh, that's why I'm in the business that I'm in, which is to help gold, re you know, begin circulating again. We pay interest to investors on gold, which means there's an incentive to invest and be, you know, make a profit investing in parts of the gold standard. That's really the only hope. I mean, I hate to toot my own horn that way, but if we don't begin to re-monetize gold, and in gold, all this perversity, obviously, zero interest rates don't occur. You know, actually, actually I'm in a unique position to speak to that, just to toot my own horn one a little bit more. You know, in, you know the comes out, when we announce that we have a deal, investors, you know, bring their gold to the deal proven that now over, you know, a lot of deals. Um, if we said the interest rate zero, we would find the no gold comes out. You can't sell gold at zero. People have to be compensated for the, for the risk and also for the lack of liquidity to give it up and get it back in a year. There's time preference, right? So um, all the perversities that are due to the Fed, um, you simply aren't possible in gold. So we have to find a way to return to gold and that way is paying interest on it and if we don't do that and scale that up you know quickly enough then um you know that's it uh for our civilization so i hate to end on such a bleak note but um at the same time i'm i'm excited for the for the chance to to fix it yeah and i'm excited for the chance for getting on the other side of this disaster and you know, rebuilding and whatever, however you want to think of it in those terms. But no, we're not going to end on a good note. I want you to end on uh, spending a minute or three minutes or five minutes or whatever you want to do. Just tell us a little about monetary metals because I don't think people understand what it is or what you do and how they can learn more information, Keith. So uh, I think you gave our website URL. It's monetary-metals.com. Um, we pay interest on gold. So we offer a gold leasing program, which is open to the uh, public. Uh, in leasing, we work with businesses that have gold or silver as inventory or work in progress. The metal is physically there. This is not a financialized product of any kind. Um, and uh, by leasing their gold out, whether it's a bullion dealer, a jewelry manufacturer, recycler, um, then uh, the person is able to earn some interest on their metal. So if you put in 100 ounces of uh, gold, and the interest rate three percent. Then at the end of the year, you have 103 ounces. So we emphasize it's about thinking about how many ounces you have rather than what's the dollar price of those ounces, because the dollar price goes up and down, but um, generally over the long term up. Um, we now uh, recently announced the first gold bond uh, in 87 years. So obviously after FDR, that was it for gold bonds after 1933, uh, and a bond is. Somebody who's borrowing, um, so it's a credit, unlike a lease, which is not a credit. Um, it's a credit, 
uh, but um, the borrower has a gold income. In this particular case, it's a gold mining company, um, has a gold income. Uh, so they're literally producing gold and um, that's how they repay. So again, they owe you know X ounces of gold regardless of the price. But as a mining company, you know, price isn't really the issue. It's how much rock you can dig and how much gold is in the rock and, and all of that. And so you pull that out of the ground, you repay the, uh, the loan. And uh, in both cases, it's a way for investors to, um, to get a return on money in money versus zero return on dollars in dollars, which is kind of where we're at now. Um, and uh, I, I, I say this, I think a simple working definition of a gold standard is when anybody who chooses to can deposit their gold and earn interest on their gold in gold. That's, a, that's what a working gold standard looks like. And that will drive all the other behaviors, including use as a medium of exchange. And so we're trying to scale that up and offer interest on gold to, you know, to the public through, through a variety of, uh, of means. Um, and, uh, and it's working. I mean, it was a radical, um, you know, idea when I was talking about it, you know, years ago, everybody in the gold community said, Keith, you're crazy. Nobody is going to give you their gold. Um, and uh, we've proven that that's, that's not true, that, that people do for a return. I, you know, you have to prove what the risk is and you have to prove you're worthy as a custodian of the gold and all those things. Um, but um, if you can do that, uh, there's a natural tendency to want to make a profit. If I'm holding this gold, why would I pay 75 basis points to store it uh, when I can get paid 300 basis points or whatever to uh, to let it be leased? So it's it's a pretty simple, and that, that's how you know, in my opinion, that's how economics works. There are simple incentives that people grasp, and then they when they understand it, they take the incentive, and when they take the incentive, then you get the behavior, and all the airy fairy mumbo jumbo of modern macroeconomics misses that point that at the end of the day, it's people saying, I'm going to choose that over that. It's, it's really that simple. I'm going to choose to get paid interest rather than to pay storage. And um, that's what makes the world go around. And if we do this right, we can undo. There's a quote from Keynes, I guess I'll leave on this note, that most of the gold people would be familiar with the first part of it when he said there's no sure way to um, uh, overthrow the capitalist order than by debauching the money. And everyone thinks he means inflation. Uh, but then he says at the end, um, by engaging all of the hidden forces of economics, which is incentives, um, in favor of destruction, and not one in a million can diagnose it. And um, when, that one in a million part, either you have to think Keynes was stupid, which I don't, or he's not talking about inflation. Because when we had big inflation in the late 70s, I was 12 years old in 1979. Every week going to the grocery store, I could notice the price of every item was up noticeably enough that I remembered it. And it was remarkable. Every day you turn on the TV news and they talked about inflation, 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 inflation. Everybody was talking about it constantly. So either Keynes was a complete idiot and said nobody would notice it, or he was talking about something else. And what I think he's talking about is this capital destruction, capital consumption that, that is incentivized. Anyways, by engaging all the hidden forces of economics, and I think, okay, here was the destroyer. Here was the Joker and Batman that Alfred is talking to Batman, and I don't remember which movie it was, and said, you know, he, he can't be reasoned with, you know, whatever. He just wants to see the world burn. And I think, well, what if you offered a, a different incentive, not to burn the world down, but to help the world rediscover a, a better place? Um, and that's what paying interest does. So if we scale that up, then now we're using gold and silver and they will re-emerge in general circulation as a consequence of people earning interest on it. And um, that's what we're trying to do. There you have it, folks. If you are interested in gold and more importantly, if you are interested in a yield on gold, go over to Monetary Dash Metals. Monetary Metals, check out what they have to offer. Keith, I'd like to thank you for joining us again on Silver Doctors. Thanks.